So, uh, we are in the book of 1 Corinthians. So, picture this. Picture this on, on, on Newsday or on, uh, you know, on Channel 12 or, or even on ABC, right? So, uh, evangelical church welcomes and shows love to everyone, and it doesn't matter who they are. That's a, that's a great headline, right? Well, it could be, depending on what it means, Depends on what it does, right? So let me, let me be very clear, right? So the church of Jesus Christ, Grace Gospel Church, and that's who we are, should be loving to all no matter what situation they are in, good, bad, or indifferent, right? But love does not mean that we, um, as a church, welcome and tolerate sin, if we can say that. So today we're going to open up to a passage uh, that you may have never heard a sermon on. And after today, you may hope that you never hear a sermon on it again, honestly. Uh, If you've been in our church for as long as I've been in our church and you you, you come most Sundays, you probably heard, because I preached this like 14 years ago or so, but, um, and and honestly, if I'm going to, you know, truly just honest. I probably wouldn't preach it if I was preaching topically, but that's why we preach through books of the Bible. And so we're in 1 Corinthians, and we're in 1 Corinthians 5, so if you would open your Bibles there. We're going to start a little mini-series, so a series within a series uh, in the book of of 1 Corinthians on on not, um, not failing to deal with issues correctly in the church, right? Remember, you remember, this is a letter to a local church. That's why we have our picture of a church, in case you didn't realize, uh, that background is us outside. And, uh, you know, we do that because, right, this is a letter to a local church. Now, I thank God, and I, I mean that. I thank God that we do not look like the Corinthian church in a lot of ways. <laughs> we are not dealing with some of the issues that they're dealing with, or, not, or most of the issues that they're dealing with. That doesn't mean we won't deal with those issues. It just means, thank God. But... But it is a church, and we recognize this church in the sense that we, we, we understand the culture that they're in. They're in a culture that is, that is pretty progressive, um, that, that is self-serving, you know, that is self-worth as far as, you know, it's all about me, it's all about what I want, it's all about what I get, and my pleasure is the highest kind of uh, ideal there. And so... Again, so he talks to the church on making sure that you deal. We've already dealt with disunity in the church, which we understand happens even in America today. Even in good evangelical churches, we understand that, that there are times when we pick up camps of certain people and we kind of do war even at times in churches. shouldn't be that way, but that happens. Um, and like I said, now we're going to talk about dealing with issues uh, correctly that often we don't want to deal with. And the first one like I said, is maybe the hardest, is ones that we don't really want to deal with, is ones that we don't often want to talk about, certainly not in a church context like this, Um, but it comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and the problem is, is that there's sin in the camp. Matter of fact, I almost labeled my sermon that, sin in the camp, and and what do you do with it? What do you do with sin in the camp? Um, well, let's look at what the problem is. Ready? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says, It is actually reported, I like how he starts out there, it's actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind that does not even exist among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. So, Right? There's a man in the congregation who's married to his father's wife. Now, probably, well, not his, his, his birth mother, but his stepmother. Now, I don't know the situation behind it. I don't know what all happened. I don't know if dad's still alive or dead. I don't know if, I, I don't even know. I, I can't even imagine. But, but Paul is, listen, Paul's not shocked by sin. You know, I, I like to say as a pastor, right, it, not, not much shocks me. Not much, you know, 
A lot of people don't want to come in there like, oh, I can't even believe it. You've probably never heard this about sin. And inside, I'm going, oh, I've heard just about it all, I think. And then every once in a while, something pops up, and I go, huh, never heard that one. Or at least I never even would imagine that we would be struggling with that, you know, or whatever. And, and Paul even says, listen, this is, you're dealing with sin. There's, there's sin among you, even in such a way that the world reels at it. That the world who doesn't know Jesus, who doesn't have a standard of Christ, says, like, are you kidding me? Like, like that, that just should never be done. And yet, here it is in the church at Cor- Corinth, um, and there's this guy who's a part of the church, a member of the church that's obviously pretty public about what's happening, common knowledge among it all, and, and understand this, he is unrepentant in his sin, and he is guilty before God. All right? So that's, that's man's sin. That's the problem that's happening here. There's, there's a sin in the church. The, the second issue, though, it's not just the man's sin. Paul wants to deal with the church's sin. Look at what it says in verse 2. He said, you have become, he's talking to the church, not to the guy, to the church. You have become arrogant and have not mourned. Instead, so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. He says, he says, interesting, they become arrogant. Now, again, we don't know the exact situation, except that maybe they are reveling in the fact that, that yo, know, listen, we just love Jesus, and we're just going to love you, and it doesn't matter. You just come in. That's what I said, that, that headline, you know, evangelical church, you know, ministers or just loves, no matter, no matter where you are. And that, that could be a great headline, and it, it should be true of us, and it shouldn't necessarily, depending on what we're talking about, right? Um, So here's the problem. There's a person in the church, and yet the church refuses to address it. And, And not only have they done nothing about it, maybe they've been proud of their acceptance of the couple. Well, we're just going to show them Jesus. You know, we're just going to love on them and and Whatever. Um, but again, this guy at least, I mean, doesn't, he doesn't talk to the woman. Maybe she's not a Christian even, but this guy is. He's a part of the church. Um, Paul says there's a problem. He says you've become arrogant. You've not mourned instead over sin. You've not been grieved over sin. Listen to the way James says to deal with sin that's in our heart that we're struggling with, he says this, James chapter 4, verse 8. He said, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinner, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Now, those are not verses that are often read or talked about in churches because what we want to say is we just want to say, live in the joy of your salvation. Everything's all right. The problem is, is as a Christian, we're talking to Christians here. As a Christian, if you're living in unrepentant sin and acting like nothing's wrong. So again, you need to hear what I'm saying. I'm not talking about people who sin because that's all of us, right? Right? We're talking about people who are unrepentant, who are walking in their sin and are, and are enjoying it in a sense, sometimes flaunting it in a sense. And, and you should, if you're walking in sin, I mean actively participating in sin in an unrepentant manner, you should not walk in the joy of the Lord. It's a weird statement from a pastor, right? What you should do is you should recognize your sin, you should grieve, you should mourn, you should weep over it. Now, what Satan does, and this is the difference, Satan wants you to stay in that mourning, and what you need to do is be mournful over your sin so that you would be repentant over your sin, so that you would come again to Jesus and recognize that his death on the cross handled that, and then you can walk in joy. 
Then you can walk in joy after you have left behind, after you have turned your back to it. To repent means to turn around and walked away. And now, Lord, I'm in you and I'm forgiving and praise God and I can walk in the joy of Jesus in what I do. We are to grieve over sin. But, but not only us, not only those who are in sin, the church. Galatians chapter two, chapter 6 verse 1 says this. Just listen, brethren, even if anyone, is, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking out to yourself so that you too may not be tempted. What does that mean? That means, listen, one of the things I love about Grace Gospel Church, and, and, and Cecil talked a little bit about it, right? He was here last year. Some of you recognized him, and you warmly welcomed him, and I love that about our church. We, our motto here at Grace Gospel is a place to call home, not because we went, hey, you know, what's a good motto for a church? Well, a place to call home. All right, let's do that, and maybe people will feel like they're at home. No, 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 no. We came up with that after we had person after person after person after person in our church say, you know... When I came here, I was greeted and I was loved and I just knew I was home, that this place was where I needed to be, that this was home for me. And we went, you know what? That's who we are, right? We're a family of God. It's exactly what we're supposed to be. But a family of God does, you know, we, we celebrate with each other and we, we weep with each other, but that doesn't only mean when things are going just, you know, like physically bad. That means in sin too. It means we go after brothers and sisters. I used to tell the story, and, 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 you know, the parable, if you will. You know, in Minnesota, we lived on a street that was right on a, a kind of a, a, it was a side road, but a main artery side road. You know what I mean? So, like maybe Granny Road, you know, so like right off North Ocean, like, I don't even know how people live on North Ocean Avenue. Holy cow. But like, not that bad, but like maybe, you know, it was pretty active. And I said, listen, if we have a gathering at our church, of our church at my house, and my kids are playing outside, my son, who was young at the time, really young, you know, they run out into the middle of the street. It is unloving for you to do nothing about that. Matter of fact, it's even, I would say, unloving to just like, oh, let me go get Patrick or Danielle, and, and, and talk to them about their kids playing in the street. That's, go get the kids out of the street, right? That's what we do. Well, and I promise you, when they're young like that, they'll kick and scream because they want to do what they want to do. I might even have a son that would say to people, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> they, uh, actually, they didn't say that. They said, you're not my dad. You're not my mom. Right? Yeah, I know, but I'm taking you to him. Let's go. You know? I mean, that's what's good about young kids. You can pick them up and take them away. Right? It's unloving just to leave somebody out. That's what it talks about in Galatians. I mean, if we love somebody, when, if, we, if they're in our family, if we're together in Christ, and they walk, again, in unrepentance, and I'm not talking about you struggle, and like you're like, crud, again, I did it, Lord, help me. Right? I mean, that, that, that's all of us. We're talking about somebody who's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Like, but in my situation, you know, it's usually not right, but in my situation, it's okay. We go after a brother. We go after a sister. We love them enough to love them in the kingdom. And so look at what Paul says. And this is, this is harsh words that are tough to bear, but he says this, verse 3. He gives the pronouncement, if you will. He said, For I, on my part, though absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this, as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? <laughs> You're like, wait, what? Like, wait, what? Like, that's crazy. Paul says he doesn't even need any more information. I mean, obviously, they're living in unrepentant sin. He's with his father's wife. He's with his stepmother. 
He's like, I don't need any more information. The sin is clear. This is not like, you know, somebody had a bad attitude and they said this to me. And then you go to them and they say, well, this was the situation. Oh, I didn't know that was the situation. I needed more, you know, wasn't that. This is clear sin. This is clear sin of walking away from the standard of God and then staying in it. And so he challenges the church at their next meeting. Now, probably not their next membership meeting, probably at, their, at the next Sunday that you deal with this, that you deal with this, that you publicly separate yourselves from this guy. Can you imagine? Can you imagine in a church where they say, you know what, you are in sin and need to walk away? Right? You need to, in other words, you break fellowship over it because of that. And he even says he delivers them over to Satan for the destruction of the body. What does that mean? It means that, in a, in a way, they're taking the covering of the Lord off of this guy. I have said often, a um, lot in my Tuesday morning study that we do, um, my prayer is, is that if I go crazy and go off from Jesus, I pray he kills me. Now, I, I'm not like, you know, I'm just saying I don't want to defame the name of God and lead people astray. Listen, heaven's not taken away from me. I'm still going to heaven, right? I just don't want to be an instrument used of Satan in some sort of blindness because we can get blind, right? I, I just, I heard again this weekend two big pastors who've had to step down because of immoral living. I mean, named, writing lots of books, influencing the church of Jesus Christ. And I'm like, Lord, why? Because we all can get tempted and caught up in sin. So what do we do? What do we do with that? Well, he's pretty clear. Jesus actually spoke to this in Matthew chapter 18. Just listen. He says, if a brother sins... Now, that means brother or sister, right? If, if somebody in the family of God, this is not like, you know, your neighbor sins, but they don't know Jesus, so I'm going to go over there and talk to them about, you shouldn't be living with that woman. All right? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about your brother who sins. He says, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won a brother. So in other words, if somebody is struggling in sin, in unrepentant sin, and you know about it, you see it, again, like this is not like, you know, I'm not really sure about what's going on, you know, like it's evident. You go and you confront them. I've had people call my office and say, Patrick, I, I saw such and such in a parking lot with not his wife or not her husband or not, the, um, uh, something's got to be done. And, and I say, well, you know what has to be done? You need to go to them. Well, I don't want to go to them. <laughs> well, that's what Scripture says. You go. I didn't see it. You know, I didn't see what was going on. You saw what was going on. So he says, go to them. He says, but if he does not listen to you, take one or more, one or two with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact might be confirmed. In other words, if they're going to argue that, well, that's really not that bad. You know what? My dad... You know, he divorced her and so now, well, I don't even know, right? Whatever. Weird situation. Take somebody else to confirm that, wait, this did happen? Yep. All right, that's sin, clearly. Let's look at Scripture, right? Let's look at Scripture. He says, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses, now that's the leadership of the church, all right? That's not, don't stand up on Sunday morning, okay? That's the leadership of the church. So if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Now, Paul's going to talk a little bit about what that means, and so I'm going to leave that. But, but again, listen, I don't even want to preach this on a Sunday morning. It's just the next passage. And it's in here for a reason, right? And it's in here for a reason because we in the church of Jesus Christ can get caught up in sin. And what we need is not people to look the other way, not people to go, well, we just love you, but people to challenge us in that. Now, I, I, I need to make a few qualifications here, all right? 
All right, so uh, it's not like a new believer comes in or a new believer, you know, a new person, you know, a person accepts Jesus Christ and we're like jumping on them for every sin that they're, you know, we need to leave room for the Holy Spirit in some things depending on what's happening, right? I mean, there are times that we need to say, wait, we're just letting God do a little work and we're, we're working in and we're talking in certain ways. You know, so there's, there's different times, but, but when you're talking about somebody who is actively present with the Lord and they walk out into sin and stay there, we need not to go, you know what, we'll give them some time out there. That's like my kids out in the middle of the street. That's why it's not good to come get me if my kids are playing in the middle of the street because that might be too long. Go get them. I love you. I love you too much even if you won't like me because of it. I love you that much. All right? As a matter of fact, Paul talks about that. What if we don't deal with this? They weren't dealing with this. What's the problem of not dealing with sin? Look at what he says, verse 5. He says, I just, I'm sorry, verse 6. He says, your boasting is not good. You know, this boasting of, of whatever, you know, we're just, we're just grace-oriented, and we're just, you know, whatever you want to live, you just live whatever you want to do. Um, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Clean out the leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice or wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So he's, our, um, he, he's, he's, Hearkening back into Passover where they had to run out of Egypt because, you know, they were going to take them because the angel of death had come and destroyed and passed over their homes of those who had the blood on the, on the mantle. And, and they didn't have enough time to leaven their bread, so they ate unleavened bread. Right? And so then from now on, God has used that as an illustration to talk about leaven being sin. And, and the problem with leaven is it, it, you know, you put just a, a dash of it in there and it works throughout the whole dough so that it leavens the whole dough. That's what sin does. Sin in the camp, that's what sin does. Well, you know, it's just them, it's not us. And yet what happens is, is that we can get. Um, hardened to it, and even hardened to sin. And you'll see this in churches, especially where leadership walks out of biblical standards and lives in unrepentant sin, often with inappropriate relationships, where, where, you, where they, they finally find that out and they deal with it, and then they find out that, that it's rampant in the church. And you go, well, he never talked about how it was okay, and yet that's just, you know what I mean, it just spreads because the sin does that. And so when you don't deal with unrepentant sin, it spreads. It becomes an option to others, especially if it's public. You know, especially if it's public. And so he says, take the old yeast out, the, the sin that is among us, let's get it out of us so that then we can walk together in Christ, encouraging others to live the same way. Let's deal with it. He's going to talk about clarifications on what this looks like. And by the way, we don't like the word that he used. Remember when he used a little bit earlier? I've already judged him. Like, I mean, some of you even saying that we're supposed to judge in church, like, it just like you go, wait a second, Jesus said don't judge other people, blah, blah, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, well, Paul's going to clarify what he means by this and what that means, okay, in judgment. All right, look at verse 9. He says, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean the immoral people of the world or the covetous, covetous or the swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of this world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? That's a rhetorical question, by the way. But those who are outside God judges, remove the wicked man from among yourselves. All right? So some clarifications on what that means when it gets to this church level. Again, not that, oh my goodness, you're a sinner. 
We all are. We struggle with sin. We're tempted with that. This is unrepentant sin where we walk that. But Paul wants to make sure what this judgment looks like and how it's to be carried out. First of all, he's very clear. We are to judge those inside the church. Now, when he says judge, understand this. He doesn't mean questioning people's salvation. I get sickened at times at how quickly some Christians will question somebody else's salvation. That's not what we're talking about, all right? But we're talking about calling sin, sin. We're calling about not be afraid to say, wait a second, that is outside biblical boundaries, and you are walking in that, and it's wrong. And especially in a culture, and maybe they struggled with this too, you know, you do you and I'll do me, right? You do you, boo. However you want to live is fine, right? Whatever feels good to you, that's fine. As long as it works for you, that's fine, Not so in the church of Jesus Christ. We live to a higher standard. We live to a biblical standard. And the reality of it is, is that we understand that every single one of us can get caught in sin. That's why he says in Galatians, be careful to look at your own heart so that you're not pulled away in sin. All of us are tempted. All of us are potential to walk into something blinded by whatever and And not seeing the Lord through it all. And if we love somebody enough, we're going to love them enough to say that's wrong. You need to stop. You need to stop what you're doing. I mean, I've had people say to me, (laughs) uh, like to my face, when I challenge them on sin, on unrepentant, clear sin, you know, don't you have something better to do? Then worry about me? To which my answer was, to this one guy I'm specifically thinking of, you actually pay me to worry about you. I'm your pastor. You pay me to worry about your stand before Jesus Christ and how you're living in Jesus Christ. You know, some of you are like, we should cut your salary. Um, <laughs> listen, we, we need it. There's a protection in that. Not a, not a. So let me, let, me, let me be clear about this. We don't excommunicate anybody. Does that make sense? We don't excommunicate. In other words, we don't kick you out of the church and go, ah, we don't want you around anymore because you're a sinner and I can't believe you did that and, you know, whatever. Um. We are to, every, every ounce of discipline, because that's what the Bible calls it in a church, is to be for the process of restoration and with the hope of restoration. We'll talk about that in a minute. So we don't judge those outside the church. I mean, those outside the church. We judge those in the church. And what does that mean? I think sometimes in the church, we expect those people out there, and I hate to even say those people like that, but because I used to be one of them, We expect them to live godly, and then we get offended when they don't. Are are you kidding me? They don't know Jesus, right? So that's God's realm. That's all right. But inside the church, we need to love each other enough, right? Paul's not asking us that we fade away into a a hole or that that we get away from each other. That's not what he's wanting us to do. Right? We, we leave. He's not telling us to, to have our own little community so that we can be protected from the world and insulated from all the sin that's happening out there. He's telling us to influence the world. The problem is sometimes the world influences us. Sometimes we buy the lies. And sometimes we live in such a way that we begin to justify our own sin instead of, instead of being true before Jesus and open in that. And so we leave that judgment to God, but make no mistake, in the church, we are to, and, and maybe, maybe a better word, and I hate to do that because God used judgment, <laughs> but maybe we would understand it a little bit if we talked about accountability, about holding each other accountable to the standard of God. Again, I'm not saying don't leave room for God. I'm not saying don't be obnoxious about it. I'm not saying we talked about this last week, right? Um, Don't just jump to a conclusion. Sometimes, you know, we we get to this point where I know what they're thinking. You better be careful about knowing what they're thinking. 
right? Give them the benefit of the doubt. Leave room for Jesus. We talked about all of that. Well, this still applies to that, but we're talking about somebody who walks away. Um, you're part of the family of God. Um, and so you know what Paul says? With somebody who has gone through a process where they will not respond to the church's admonitions and pleas to walk out of their sin, he says to treat them like an unbeliever. Uh, Jesus said treat them like a, a Gentile or a tax collector. Now, there was a certain language that went with that, and, and, and what that means, what does that mean? That means you treat them like they don't know. Now, it doesn't mean that you question their salvation, but it does mean you might give them the gospel again. That, that might mean that, you know, listen, if, if you're able to walk in this without repentance, then, 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 then let's talk about who Jesus is. And let's talk about what he's done for us on the cross. And let's talk about what that means for us, that we're now a new creation. And like we talked about a, a week or two or three ago, that, that it's just we, we're not trying to earn anything before God because we're already saved. I'm already righteous before God, but I need to live out who I am. And when I'm not living out who I am, I need to have people that love me enough to say, hey, you can do better. Right? And so, what is that? He says, don't even have a meal with such a one. I think that means, and, and now this is a little bit of interpretation, and so, you know, you could be absolute on this. I don't think that doesn't mean that you don't have a meal with somebody. Well, wait, Patrick, it said don't, don't have a meal. I think what that means is you don't act like everything's okay. In other words, let me just go to lunch with you and see how you're doing. I might invite you to lunch, but we're going to talk about what's going on. Well, I didn't come to lunch for that. Well, guess what? I can't sit with you and act like everything's okay because it's not. Doesn't mean I don't invite them to church and I don't want them to be in the church. But it, but it might mean that I don't let them just sit in that like everything's okay and we just hug them like everything's fine. It's not fine. It's not fine. And so really what it means is no fellowship. So it's interesting. Cecil said he wants, very excitedly, I don't know if you know, uh, I love Cecil's energy. Do you like Cecil's energy, man? He just brings the energy, right? So... Um, he said he wants them to enjoy the kind of fellowship we have, right? And that is absolutely true where there's love. And again, that doesn't mean you don't hug somebody, but it means that I can't just leave you, like, like act like nothing's wrong. Like we're just going to enjoy fellowship and be all cozy and great. And isn't God good? Yes, he is. Yeah, I know there's that thing over there. As Troy said, the elephant in the room. It's not a pink flamingo. Too often, the elephant in the room is that, like, are, are we going to address that ever? Are we? Okay? Um, so it means that we, we continue to give them Jesus at every opportunity. And, and again, if, if I go back, because I might go back and preach the gospel to have a person say to me, listen, I know that Jesus Christ died for my sin. Okay, then... You've just affirmed that again, because I need to make sure. So why are you walking like this? Why are you doing this? You need to stop it. Um, the, what's the purpose of all this? The purpose of all this is twofold. One is to protect the church, and the other is to restore the unrepentant brother or sister. It is always about restoration. It is always about restoration. Right? And it's vital to stress that we're talking about, like I said, unrepentant sin here. Those, not, not those who are struggling in sin. Hello? Not that I'm struggling in, in deep sin, but there are still attitudes that come out of me. There are still things that happen in me. There are still thoughts that happen to me. Sometimes I'm judging people. You know, um, I, I was judging you guys who liked the Mets until the Yankees fell apart. And then I went, well, look, I guess I'm just like you. <laughs> Blowing it again. Um, I'm trying to make a joke just to, but, right? I mean, we do that. We look at people and we judge them by the outside. Don't we? 
don't we? We've got to be careful of that. We've got to be careful of what we do. Um, I want to I give you a situation that I dealt with in a church. Not, not this church. It was a long time ago. I was a very young pastor, and I was crying out to God, why me? Honestly, why me? We had a, a, a gentleman, a married couple in our church. They had gone through our membership class. We had talked about discipline in our church. And anyway, he, I don't remember the whole situation. He came home one day, found out that she had been, somehow found out that she had been in an affair, active affair with a, a gentleman. And uh, he confronted her, and she left the house and moved in with the guy. Moved in with the guy. And... Uh, uh, it, it, was, it, it didn't take one witness or two witnesses. Everybody knew about it right away. It was extremely public. Um, small town. And uh, they, um, so several people went to her. I finally got her in my office and we talked and, and, and I, I begged her actually, you know, leave. I said, I'll, I'll, we'll pay as a church for a hotel room for a few nights and then I'll, because I know you might not even be able to go home right now. That's, I, I'm, but you need to leave the situation. And she just refused, and uh, we actually wrote a letter from the church to her in the end that said, if, if you don't, we're going to have to remove you from membership. We had an elder's wife take that to her. She said, very public, you know, well, she said to her, I know that it's wrong. I can't leave. And so then we, at, at that point, we don't do that in this, we don't vote for a congregational meeting. We vote among the elder board, but, but we removed them from membership. Um, to which she got very offended. To, by the way, when her, when, when eventually she came back to me and said, you know, aren't you going to deal with him? He's the one who was now seeing another girl so quickly and living with her right away. Like, I'm like, what? And he's like, don't you have something better to do? And I said, nope, I don't. Because um, it's crazy. Like, how do you expect me to hold her by a standard but not you? Hello? Right? Because that's what happens. People just go crazy. Um, now, I know you might go, oh, because some of you might be like, oh, man, I've not lived completely right before Jesus. Welcome to the club. And I don't mean to say that flippantly. But I want to tell you, during that time, I had been counseling with a, with a gentleman, older man, who had been struggling with homosexuality for um, years since he was a young kid. He had been abused very, it was horrific, been abu abused. And we had been counseling. He had asked me to counsel him, told me he was struggling in this. I said, I don't have any experience in that. Um, we couldn't find a counselor who did in our area, and so I said, I'll walk with you if, you know, you'll let me. And so we walked together, and, and, and he struggled in it. So get that. When you're struggling in homosexuality, that means something, right? And so there were times where we, uh, we took him down from ministry because he had served in some ministries of ours, and we took him out of that. We did eventually take him before the elder board, and, and, and he those times that he did struggle, he was repentant, he understood, we had lots of conversations, but he came up to me after that meeting where we voted this woman out of our church, and he said, I'm really scared, and I said, what are you scared about? And he said, I'm scared that you're going to get tired of my struggle and that you're going to vote me out of the church, and I had a good moment in God, I don't always have these but I said to him, I said, I'll tell you what. I said, if you continue to put yourself under the discipline of the elder board, which he had, if you continue to struggle with me, if we, you know, we're, and we had, I mean, I, I, I can't tell you the whole story. It just, it was, he struggled with it. And um, I said, if you continue that struggle, continue to put yourself on, continue to be repentant about sin, we will never vote you out of membership. I said, I can also make you a promise that if you come to me one day and say, hey, I just can't help it, I'm going to live this lifestyle, I said, we will vote you out of membership. And his response to me was, oh, whew, okay, I can handle that. Because his heart was right before God. He was just struggling with a lot of stuff in his past, and a lot of stuff happening and struggling with himself. Now, why do I say that? I say that because it's not about sin. It is about love, ultimately. We just had a membership class last Sunday night, and, and you know, why, should I, why should I join? Like, if you're going to kick me out one day if I go rogue, why would I join? Because we love you that much. Because we take responsibility and accountability for you 
as a member of our church that we love you that much, that we care, that we're not just going to let you wander off. And for those who are right in the Lord, there's comfort in that. Now, let me tell you something else. What's, what's, what's awesome, and there's plenty of testimonies, and, and, and just so you know, we've had several people, even in my time here and in other churches, who have come under the discipline of the elder board who have never been voted out because there was repentance and restoration. And you'll never know about it. Um, where there's been repentance and restoration and where God is glorified. And let me tell you something. Where there is that God takes what we tend to burn to the ground and he makes things beautiful out of that. Isaiah 61 says that he makes beauty from ashes, maybe 60. The oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that we might be trees of righteousness, a planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. See, the reality is we all have a past, and that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about your past. We're not talking about that you've sinned in some pretty great ways. We're talking about, and and, and in the end, we give glory to God because of what he has done in us because of that even, because he has sacrificed himself and he has died for that, and now we can walk in him to his glory. We're going to sing a song in a few minutes, and I didn't ask Jimmy to pick it. He just did, you know, Graves into Gardens. And our hope, even when there's somebody who struggles, is not that, oh, I can't believe you. We can't, we can't take sin in our church like, like none of us sin. Like if you're afraid in our church because like everybody is so righteous and you're struggling in sin, um, I just got to tell you, you're in the right place. Now, you're in the right place because we're not going to tolerate that sin. You know, we're a hospital, right? We invite all sick people in. But we're not going to tolerate sickness. We're going to heal that sickness so that we walk out healthy. And that's what we're called to be as a church of Jesus Christ. So guess what? Welcome to the family. This is what the family of God looks like. This is what church is about in those parts that we don't want to talk about. It is about loving each other enough that we come after them, that we don't let somebody go, that we don't just let them wander off in sin, but we love them as much as we can and as much as they'll let us to the glory of God. Let me pray. Father God, I love you. Thank you for your grace. I uh, quite honestly don't like preaching that passage. Um, But you didn't ask me if I liked it. You just put it there and I'm called to preach the word of God, the full, complete word of God. And so we did that today and uh, we asked, Lord, that you would be very real among us, that you would make us a church that, Lord, I pray I would never, ever, 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 ever have to challenge anybody in this body with unrepentant sin. Lord, um, and if I do, I pray I have to, I do it in grace and in humility. It is the most humbling things I've ever done in ministry at times. Um, but, Father, may we do it to your glory. May we do it with a heart for, of love for each other. May we do it as a people of God wanting to honor you with all that we are and all that we do. I love you, Lord, and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.